Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, good afternoon and good evening for those across the world that are joining us today. Uh, my name is Rachel Moussier, and I am the Deputy Director of the Social Protection uh, Program at, at WIGO. We would like to welcome you all to this webinar on childcare services and women's work. Thank you for joining. Uh, just a little bit more, um, uh, we'd also like to thank socialprotection.org for this platform and this space um, and for facilitating this discussion today. So just a bit more on uh, WIGO. WIGO is a global policy research and action network, including informal workers organizations, researchers, statisticians, and development practitioners. Uh, we support informal workers organizations um, to improve their working conditions, recognizing that they represent 61% of the global labor force. And uh, a key part of our social protection program is, uh, and one of our key areas of focus is extension of quality child care services to women uh, workers in the informal economy. For those of you who have uh, just joined us, just to let you know that there is Spanish and English interpretation provided, uh, please click on the interpretation button that you will see here. And the instructions you can find on the chat. Great. So, um, to start off this webinar, I would like to thank the co-sponsors of the event, um, in particular, the Early Childhood Development Action Network, ECDAN, the International Domestic Workers Federation, Nelson Mandela Foundation, and Public Services International and UN Women. Uh, without their support over these past couple of weeks, we wouldn't have been able to make it all here today. We'd also like to thank our keynote speaker, Ms. Isabella Sikawana, from the South African Department for Social Development for joining us today to share the perspective from government on the needs to invest and improve childcare services amidst this pandemic. The panelists and co-sponsors make up quite a diverse array of stakeholders uh, representing childcare workers, policymakers in the ECD sector, multilateral organizations, trade unions, and gender and social protection spe specialists. We also hear, see here in the chat that we um, have Carolina Zanino from the National Directorate of Economy, Equality and Gender um, of the Ministry of Economy of Argentina. So it's just to show the diversity, both of our speakers and hopefully of the attendees here. Um, the group of speakers really demonstrates both the willingness and necessity to speak across communities of practice and movements to address the child care crisis. The crisis in child care provision was evident prior to the pandemic. The World Bank's recent report on uh, child care estimates that 350 million children did not have access to child care services. Nearly eight out of 10 of these children live in low or lower middle income countries. When we refer to child care, we mean center based or home based care, care provided for children between the ages of zero to three years old, aimed at giving them a safe space for stimulation and growth through access to nutritious meals, care, and play. We also include child care provided by domestic workers in their employers' homes. The pandemic has intensified the child care crisis, bringing national care systems, child care systems to the brink of collapse. It has highlighted the large number of child care workers, most of whom, whom are women in the informal economy, lacking access to public subsidies and labor and social protections once the crash, crash is closed. Households that relied on domestic workers for childcare provision were also suddenly without the service during lockdown. Domestic workers were either unable to continue working or were asked or coerced uh, to live with their employers to provide childcare services, often without protective pers personal equipment or higher wages. The little value placed on the dignity and contribution of childcare workers is a reflection of gendered and racialized norms around caregiving, with the sector characterized by high reliance 
um, on migrant labor, low wages, insecure employment, and low trade union affiliation. And in addition, many domestic workers and other childcare workers who are largely informal workers also lost their childcare support systems due to the pandemic. The first phase of WIGO's global survey of informal workers across 12 cities showed that women informal workers with care responsibilities were earning only 40% of their pre-COVID earnings after lockdown measures were eased in July last year. All other informal workers surveyed were earning 60% of their pre-COVID earnings. The key barrier identified by women informal workers was the time that they spend caring for children due to the school, due to school closures. As the pandemic rages in many countries and social protection relief measures taper off, women informal workers cannot afford to stop working. They continue to work while caring for their children and bearing the accumulated risks alone. I'm just going to pause here just in case, is there a problem with the Spanish translation interpretation? Just to make sure that participants know that you can click on the interpretation button and you should be able to reach the Spanish. Great, thank you. So what we've seen as the pandemic has rolled out is that, is that the, the impact on women themselves and the young children in their homes is tremendous. Hunger and child poverty rates are increasing dramatically. And now is the time for rich, complex, and at times tense discussions about how to rebuild the social organization of care. The funding challenges brought on by the pandemic are real, but so is the need for quality childcare if economies are to recover. Our panelists will explore what greater public investment in the childcare sector should include to better protect all childcare workers, including domestic workers. Investing in these workers will contribute to better quality childcare services for some of the most vulnerable children and the working women and men who care for them. We are encouraged by countries such as South Africa that have announced an employment stimulus relief fund for the early childhood development, for early childhood development services. This is not only indicative of support to childcare workers, but also of the broad dialogue that is taking place in South Africa between ECD providers, researchers, civil society, and policymakers. So I, I, I hear from the chat that uh, before I introduce the speakers, um, that my introduction uh, was cut short. So in the recording, so let me just share with you. My name is Rachel Moussier. I'm the Deputy Director of the Social Protection Program at WIGO. WIGO is a global research and policy network that brings together informal workers organizations, um, uh, researchers, statisticians, and development practitioners. Uh, within the Social Protection Program, uh, we have a key pillar of work that is focused on uh, improving uh, informal workers, particularly women's access to uh, childcare services, given that women are primary caregivers, as well as um, contributors in terms of their paid work to, household, to the household. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have um, Ms. Isabella Sekawana, who, who is a social worker by profession but she is joining us from as the uh, Chief Director of the Early Childhood Development Legislation and Families in the National Department of Social Development in South Africa. She's also currently the Acting Deputy Director General for Welfare Services. Welcome, Isabella. Our next speaker will be Elizabeth, Elizabeth Lule. She is the Executive Director of the Early Childhood Development Action Network. Before joining ECDAN, she worked on global health issues affecting women, children, and infants at the World Bank, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Pathfinder International, and USAID. From Chile, we are very pleased to have uh, Selma Nunez Parada. She is a, a child educator and the educational and at the Educational and Child Care Unit of the Public Hospital in Santiago, Chile. 
She's the leader of the National Confederation of University Professionals of Health Services. And for the past five years, she has worked with the Ministry of Health to articulate the childcare demands of workers in healthcare facilities. Um, from across the world now, from today we go to Hong Kong. We have, we're very um, honored to have two speakers from Hong Kong today. We have Fish Ip, who is a union organizer for domestic workers. She's a founding member of the Hong Kong Domestic Workers General Union and the Hong Kong Federation of Asian Domestic Workers Unions, organizing both local and migrant workers. She wears another hat as she's also the Asia Regional Coordinator for the International Domestic Workers Federation. With Fish, um, speaking with Fish, we have Chila, uh, Ch uh, Sheila Estrada, and she's been working as a migrant domestic worker for 35 years in Hong Kong and Singapore, a union leader for over 30 years. She founded several migrant workers unions, including the Progressive Labor Union of Domestic Workers in Hong Kong, PLU, and the Hong Kong Federation of Domestic Workers Unions. So welcome, Sheila, and special welcome to Fish and Sheila as it's quite late their time in Hong Kong. Um, and Silk, Silk Estab will be our discussant for this, for this uh, conversation today. She's a research specialist at UN Women and co-author of several of the organization's flagship reports. Silke has published widely on gender, social protection, and child care policies, and worked as a, as a researcher at UNRIST and the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. So welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you for joining us. And again, thanks to the, to the participants for being here today. Before we get, uh, so uh, we will start the, panel will start off with um, Is Isabella, who will share a keynote address, and then we will go through the list of speakers. You, There is an option on your screens to go through to the question and answer to provide, um, to, to share any reflections, but also ask any questions of the panelists, which we will take up at the end of the presentations. But before we, we start with Isabella's keynote address, I would like to share a video uh, made by the Nelson Mandela Foundation. The video um, profiles some of the incredible ECD practitioners in their network, in the Nelson Mandela Foundation's network, who are at the forefront of ECD delivery in their communities. Their commitment to providing ECD in the face of the hardship right now is a source of inspiration. So thank you all. Can I ask all the speakers to turn off their videos so we can give full visual to the, to the video that we'll be screening? Many thanks. Ninety percent of ECDs uh, don't comply with the funding from the government, so it is hard for us to pay a minimum wage to our practitioners because we rely mostly on uh, school fees from the parents, no other subsidy that we receive. And from that fees, we expect the centre to run smoothly, maintenance, salaries, food, and we. Uh, Inspectors will come and expect that food to be a balanced meal, not just uh, soup and same instant porridge every day. For you to develop uh, the children holistically, you need to have much more toys. So you, have, you need to have the jungle gym. And jungle gym alone, it is most like 20,000, 27,000, 30, it depends. And you want them to you know, develop holistically. Some of the kids, they don't afford and you'll end up seeing the situation that this parent was able to afford and then at the moment they're not able to afford so let, maybe let me just cut so that they can pay half of what they're paying just so that the child doesn't go back and be on the street. You know, these women, they're mothers. They've got children, they've got brothers, they've got sisters and most of them, because of the economical factors or anything that is going on, they are firstly breadwinners. You see, most women, we have the passion, but we don't have the support. They have many, many challenges. Paying rent, clothing their children, having food, it's very difficult. They are also trying to provide for their own families. If that uh, breakfast is not there, 
and the fees money is finished as a principal because these people are in your house or in your garage or in your mkuku in your school you are going to have to make a plan which means you're going to have to take from your children's table and feed the community that is in your house that you called and say i will feed you i will teach you i will safeguard you so i think the only uh, person or people who can help us it's the government to you know fund the the, the child and then please let them not uh, they must know that every child is important and maybe is some of the the the, the, the bylaws so that we manage to you know uh, uh, comply 100% so that we get the funding if the bylaws in different uh, municipality are taken serious and reviewed at the same time so that everyone can get access of funding from uh, not from the government alone from uh, every stakeholders educational resources that is the most important thing because you know what these kids then I, whether I'm in a shack, I need to be able to touch that toy and you know feel the texture, round it up, ask questions about it, do everything you know that even that child in a different area is able to do. Because these two kids, one day they're going to be in the same classroom in a university, and that lecturer is going to look at them equal. I cannot say I need support from parents. Obviously, they don't have uh, jobs. And then I don't want children to, be, to remain at home. Because now that means we're building the failing South Africa or the failing world, you know. So government, it goes back to the government. We're pleading and asking them to, you know, stand up and provide for the ECD. Thank you to once again to the Nelson Mandela Foundation for that video and for the ECD practitioners who shared so eloquently some of the struggles that they're facing today. I would like to hand over to Isabella uh, to give us the keynote address, building off of what we've just seen now from this video. It would be, I think, important for this group here to hear a little bit about more about what the um, what is the Employment Stimulus Relief Fund for Early Childhood uh, Development Services and how your department expects it to reach um, children of informal workers or children in informal settlements in rural areas. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Program Director. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me take this opportunity to really appreciate you know, the opportunity that has been granted to me as a representative from the Department of Social Development you know, to participate in this important webinar. I really thank you and I send greetings from uh, South Africa. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, as you have already said, uh, you just want to know about how the Singers Relief Fund support ECD uh, provision to children of informal, uh, living in informal settlement in rural areas. I'm sure all of us, we know now more than ever that a child's earliest, earliest years presents a window of opportunity for us to uh, address inequality and improve life outcomes. Evidence from around the globe demonstrates that the return on investment in a child's early years are substantial particularly when compared to equivalent investments made later in life. The benefits of such investments can accrue to individual children and to society more broadly if intentionally managed and can help to achieve diverse policy objectives, including increasing labor participation and decreasing unemployment, reaching marginalized populations and re reducing intergenerational transfers. While many countries are becoming to realize or have realized the importance of early childhood development, there is still a need to align this priority with prevailing systems and processes. And South Africa is not immune to that. In short, there is more work to do uh, to ensure that countries walk the talk. 
uh, in South Africa, we have uh, the principal act that is called the Children's Act of 38 of 2005, which regulates you know, the provision of ECD services in the country. And uh, we are quite aware that um, there is really um, some challenges in terms of ECD access, uh, uh, being able to register. And that is why we are in a process of ensuring that we amend this legislation so that we can be able you know, to reach to more ECDs. It can be user-friendly and reach to more ECDs for them to be able to register so that they can be able to access the benefits after they have registered. We know that in terms of access deficits, not only are there millions of children who lack access to any ECD services, but there are also many who receive inadequate access. Certainly, we also know that many of these children are from lower income groups who are less likely to access an early learning program, highlighting the likely role that costs as a barrier to access. This is evidenced in South Africa, where although attendance of ECD programs among zero to four years old have increased significantly from 2009 to 2018, there is an inequality of access across income groups, with the access gap being the widest between the richest, those that in quintile five, and poorest children in quintile one, among the children aged one to three. A three-year-old in quintile five is twice as likely to attend an early learning program as a child of the same age in quintile one. Thus, while we are fortunate that we have been able to see over the decades the increasing numbers of children surviving, there is still a lot more work to do to ensure that we don't start life at a disadvantage and to make sure that they do not merely survive but thrive. As outlined in Mandela Initiative Report of 2018, young children, unlike students, for example, are silent and mostly invisible constituency. They do not have political voice. They cannot vote or protest. It is thus our responsibility to make sure that we take action on behalf of these young children so that they can reach their full potential. In recent years, there has been a move towards establishing intersectoral ECD policies. There has been a growth in the number of countries who have multi-sectoral early childhood development policies. South Africa developed its own multi-sectoral ECD policy in 2018 called the National Integrated ECD Policy, which mentions many departments and entities responsibilities in relation to ECD delivery. This reinforces the point that responsibility for ECD does not belong to any one sector and it requires an integrated set of services and programs that cuts across departments as well as different spheres of government, national, provincial, and local. However, bring, bringing these different spheres and departments together is challenging, which this multi-sectoral nature of ECD being something which is not unique to South Africa and neither is the struggle to achieve a coordinated approach to ECD delivery. In South Africa's National Integrated ECD Policy of 2015, we set ourselves the aim of achieving universal access to quality ECD, which we define in a, as ensuring that quantity services are available to all children whose parents wish them to use such services. And that cost and other barriers such as disability should not prevent those who wish to make use of these services from doing so. Funding only cannot assist to achieve access. We also need to do more in conscientizing society in general, families, caregivers of the critical importance of early learning for a child a child's development. In South Africa, we've got subsidy. We are subsidizing children uh, who are from the poor households. And we are quite aware that it is not enough because these uh, children that we are subsidizing are from the registered ECDs, but also the numbers as compared to the demand are not enough. We still have to do more as a country. Poverty is a barrier to access and quality. With parents' fees being a barrier to access in South Africa, ECD centers are NPO run with government subsidizing, as I've already said, you know, access to these uh, services. With the prevailing socioeconomic services, not only are ECD services important for a 
stimulation perspective, but also a nutrition pers uh, perspective as children to attend ECD centers that are subsidized by the Department of Social Development are able to provide food to children in attendance. This one serves to make the monthly subsidy that the Department of Social Development gives to registered ECD centers vital as it helps subsidize the fees expected of parents. As government, we recognize that early childhood development centers in poor areas provide a critical service and should therefore not be treated as, as a typical business. The provision of early childhood development in a public-private partnership and our attitude towards the sector should reflect this. As such, we provide per subsidies, as I've already said, in the ECD centers. And unfortunately, as I said, many ECDs remain unsubsidized. The Department of Social Development introduced the ECD registration framework which allows for different categories of registration because we, we know that subsidy for, for a, an ECD to qualify for a subsidy, it has to be registered. And when we look you know, at the norms and standards, we realize that you know, uh, most of ECDs cannot be able to reach you know, the, the level of registration as prescribed by the norms and standards. And therefore we have been able to introduce an ECD registration framework, which allows different categories of registration according to bronze, which is the entry level with the bare minimum norms that needs to be met, which we have categorized as those that are obligatory and cannot be compromised, but are at the bare minimum. And the other categories are silver and gold. So as to make it easier for ECD centers to register. Work has commenced to implement this framework through the Wanga Sali, a campaign. The Wanga Sali is a Tonga place. We've got a different uh, languages in South Africa. I'm so all you know that we've got 11 languages. It's Wanga Sali is the Tonga language, which, which means no child should be left behind, which is aimed at achieving registration massification. There's, however, a lot of more work that needs to happen to align municipality compliance requirements with this framework, which we are committed to doing. The road ahead is achieving in achieving this is complex, involving different spheres of government, different government departments and various pieces of legislation. We believe policy is developed by people and can thus be amended. And where policy does not serve the needs of the poor, they need to be amended and changed, even in the face of like regulatory hurdles. However, we believe that the best interest of the child should be at the center of everything. I want to turn my attention to the ECD Employment Stimulus Relief Fund. When the pandemic hit us, all last year, it caught us off guard as a country and as a global community. The ECD sector was not immune to the fault times that the pandemic laid bare along the lines of race, income and wealth with children in well of families having continued access to stimulation through online learning and having the benefit of parents working from home. While many children in poor communities lacked internet access and with many of their parents and caregivers being home as a consequence of unemployment, which had an impact on their food supply and nutrition and with many of their parents and caregivers also being considered essential workers and thus had to go to work. The presidential stim employment stimulus was set up by the presidency of South Africa to support a range of programs ranging from expanding public employment to protecting existing jobs and creating new jobs. It aims to support livelihoods while the labor market recovers and in particular to support job protection and creation in response to coronavirus pandemic. The Department of Social Development successfully secured 496 million from National Treasury with the aim of securing some of the support for the ECD workforce. The aim was to provide support to 108,833 ECD workers with income support through existing ECD programs. Given the significant cost associated with employment and the importance role of ECD workforce in the provision of ECD services, the ECD stimulus relief is aimed at supplementing the income generated by the ECD services through subsidizing the cost of employment. We wanted to help with restoring the provision of ECD services, support continued operation and reduce the risk of permanent closure. The ECD relief fund was allocated as a conditional grant. 
which meant that while the National Department of Social Development could manage and oversee the funding process, it was provincial departments who could only pay out these grants to the sector. We therefore centralized application system where we did, we, we did call for proposals and verification at national level and send some batches to the provinces uh, to pay for payment. This was done in order to transfer this fund funding for those who need it most whilst maintaining the appropriate controls required by the Public Finance Management Act in line with the prescriptions given by the National Treasury. The types of ECD services that were eligible included ECD centers as well as non-center based such as play groups, your toy libraries, your child minders, and mobile ECD programs. Unlike the ECD subsidy I spoke earlier, an ECD service did not need to be registered as a nonprofit organization to receive this benefit, nor did it need to be registered in line with the Children's Act 38 of 2005 uh, that I've talked about. We recognize that the majority of ECD services are unregistered and are hard hit by the coronavirus pandemic, majority of which are in disadvantaged community. There were various levels of screenings that needed to transpire in order to receive funding. For instance, the details of staff members were checked against the National Population Register to check whether the staff members existed. In this regard, we were able to identify 3,729 ECB staff applied for the relief are uh, actually employed by government, where, whereas, 30, whereas 98 were diseased. Some details of the staff members were, such as ID numbers were entered incorrect and the ECD operators were sent SMSs and given time to correct the information as government had to ensure that staff members who ECD operators were making an application for did exist as the money used for this relief is taxpayers' money. And as such, we as public officials have a responsibility to ensure that the money is not lost to fraud. To accommodate small ECD centers and non-center based uh, programs that are usually individually run, the department approved the NPO umbrella organizations um, that could apply on behalf of multiple organizations that they know work with and support. Changes were made to allow not only MPOs, but also organization largely changes, et cetera, that are categorized as public benefit organizations to also apply for multiple ECDs. The provincial departments of social development working with partners in the ECD dispersed a number of organizations to assist ECD services with applications. We also brought on board a number of Harambe youth support services who were mobilized to assist organizations with their application. This is one project that brought all real role players within a short space of period within the ECD sector. This process was important as it enabled us to develop a database of ECD workforce also in unregistered ECD services, which we did not previously have. We were further able to identify some employees applied for who were employed by government and some disease. I'm citing these examples and speaking to these issues uh, to demonstrate that there was a balancing act in implementing the ECD stimulus relief fund. Because while on the one hand, we wanted to make it accessible to the poor, we could not remove controls altogether because the nature of using public funding means that there are processes that need to be in place, which go far beyond the prescripts of any department and which are subject to interrogation by the Auditor General. We would, however, not pay all ECD services as the financial year end of government ended, which meant that we had to apply for rollover of funding from provincial treasuries. At present, we are awaiting response, which will then enable provincial departments to pay the rest of qualifying staff members. Many lessons have been learned from implementing the stimulus, which the most important lesson being that everybody deserves to be part of the system. Being employed in the informal sector should not mean that people, should not mean that because you do not fit within the neat confines of government system that you are ignored or you can be ignored. However, this must be done within the confinement of the law. We must do 
better as a country, as a global community to realize this, not in the ECD sector, but many other sectors which employ uh, workers that are seen as forming part of the informal uh, economy. I really want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, as I'm looking forward to working with ECD sector in South Africa and other parts of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isabella, for, for the detail you provided and also just the innovation that has come into uh, registering new ECD providers um, and reaching out, um, the making sure that more ECD providers, even if they are unregistered, can access the relief fund. We've learned a lot from that example. I'm, I'm going to um, ask Elizabeth Lule to, to share some reflections from the global ECD community, um, sort of perhaps building on what Isabella has shared from the South African experience of what, what could uh, campaigning for childcare, for quality childcare services look like? Um, so it would be great to hear from you and uh, Elizabeth around the work that ECDAN and the regional networks are doing to promote childcare for all. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Isabella, for that inspire, is very inspiring um, speech and sharing uh, what the government of South Africa has done to respond and to be inclusive and to look at the equity issues. It can be done, and I think we have great examples to learn uh, from uh, for us to continue this work. So greetings from the early childhood um, development um, global network um, and many thanks to the organizers and the co-sponsoring organizations for including us. It is wonderful to connect with socialprotection.org. We have a lot in common in what we do. Uh, next, please. Um, so for those of you who don't know about ECDAN, we're a global platform that connects partners and individual members to bridge silos, stimulate collective action, innovate through collaboration to produce benefits at scale beyond what any individual uh, partner and sector can do um, on their own. And uh, who we are, um, we have uh, many partners that include multilaterals and uh, the UN agencies included, of course, and, and uh, international financing organizations. We also have about 6,000 individual members who are policymakers and uh, also um, implementers, but also parents. And the regional networks from Africa, Asia Pacific, um, the Arab and Middle East countries, um, as well as uh, Europe and um, Central Asia, um, uh, the co-partners of, of ECDAN. We operate through them. They are the channels um, that reach out uh, to regional bodies, but also are connected to the countries. And as networks of networks, we also leverage the global partnerships, um, the sector partnerships, but also um, the thematic partnerships like uh, ending violence against children. And our aim is to make sure that these global partnerships deepen their focus on um, ECD and vice versa, we would also deepen the issues that they care about. And we have several memorandum of, uh, under, of collaboration with these partners. Next, please. Um, so the regional networks and ECDAN, uh, these are the functions that we do. We advocate and communicate, of course, for increased investments um, in young children and their families, uh, and uh, having um, family-friendly policies as well. Uh, we, call, we learn and share, and uh, uh, peer learning and cross-country uh, learning has been our focus. Uh, we coordinate, connect, and align um, across the um, different sectors that are involved. Uh, and of course, movement building is also part of what we do, building alliances and um, coalitions um, so that we can amplify our voices. Next, please. 
And these are some of the examples of some of the global um, public goods that we do, a cost of inaction tool, for example, that will be online and countries can plug in their GDPs and then can actually co calculate depending on the um, interventions they select, um, the, the benefits foregone for not investing in the early years. Uh, we share uh, with COVID-19, all our partners shared their resources that we have been disseminating. And we also have a global forum on childcare resources that partners have been contributing. Next. Um, so how do we tackle the global child care crisis that uh, it was there before COVID-19, but it has been exacerbated? And we share an overall framework. Obviously, we have to fix the system. And the systems approach uh, is very important, looking, as Isabella also mentioned, looking at the financing, the policies, the workforce issues, data, of course, the laws and regulation is so important. But we also think that bridging movements, networks, sectors, uh, because the benefits uh, cut across child care would everybody wins if we're able to have universal affordable um, child care of good quality. And then, of course, we can't do this unless if we have the grassroots champions um, to demand action from governments. And, and how do we build um, that capacity at the grassroots level, uh, whether it's national um, uh, champions and uh, involving the non-state actors and civil society in particular. Next, please. I think the opportunities have been uh, um, to address childcare across partners have been mentioned. Uh, promoting benefits for women, children, families, informal workers, adolescent girls, businesses and economies, child care as the bridge between ge the, the gender and the ECD communities, promoting equity with a focus on informal workers and other vulnerable families, and then within the COVID-19 recovery efforts, getting parents back to work. Uh, getting the older children, especially girls, back to school, providing quality jobs for child care practitioners. And let's have child care be included in more countries that are currently developing their stimulus packages. Next, please. So at the grassroots um, between ECDAN and the regional networks is how do we create these national global, regional, national child care platforms for knowledge exchange and peer learning, um, maybe having a child care scale up marketplace. How do we get from the dismal situation we're in to actually achieving universal child care for everybody? Uh, and uh, building a, na a national networks of grassroots champions, and of course, non-state actors and the private sector are also extremely important. How do we mandate uh, childcare for the workers that work in all these um, uh, businesses um, and so on? Next, please. <clears throat> Um, I will skip this one so that I can get to the end. Um, but, but this, sorry, can we go back to that one quickly? Um, I think the important thing is how do we connect and engage the movements? And we are obviously, th this meeting is an example of how we can build coalitions with uh, those who work on gender, the labor rights movements, the trade unions, um, and other influencers, and how do we mobilize global, regional, high-level childcare champions to influence the G20, the G7? We've seen that the C7 has already included childcare in their communication to the meeting of the G7, and the regional networks obviously will reach out also to their regional commissions. Next, please. Um, this is just an example of how we can um, leverage across multiple sectors to support childcare, and I won't go through the details. Next, please. Uh, next, please. 
So I want to very quickly uh, give a spotlight on the global child care advocacy campaign. How do we, our objectives are to amplify voices and mobilize, improve policy and funding practice. Um, and obviously quality uh, assurance is always, and, and safety uh, and affordability and inclusion are always um, at the basis of this. Next, please. Uh, we will use the policy framework that has been recommended by the World Bank and equity and institutional arrangements um, and quality assurance are already highlighted in this. And of course, uh, the financing is also very important, but promoting diverse types of provision that are convenient for, for parents is extremely important. Next, please. Uh, these are some of the influencing approaches that we will use, um, a compelling narrative that we all talk in the same way uh, and sing from the same um, song, you know, songbook and mobilize and engage the public around this issue. It cannot be an academic issue. Next, please. Uh, these are some of the campaign guiding principles, and uh, I won't read all of them, but this is uh, an umbrella campaign bringing existing campaigns, initiatives, projects, centers around the same agenda. And it's framed within the key policy frameworks, especially the SDGs, labor and human rights frameworks um, across gender equality, labor rights, child health and nutrition, protection and education and uh, focuses on policy and funding in low and middle-income countries through national, regional, and global advocacy. And we emphasize and prioritize multi-stakeholder and multi-sector engagement, in particular, women's rights and gender equality um, as well. And also we are talking with other key stakeholders, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Center for Global Development, the Generation Equality, and I'm so glad to see that UN Women will provide us the leadership. Finally, then last slide. Uh, this is the overall planning structure. Um, ECDAN and the regional networks will work. Uh, it's an open tent. Please join us and let's amplify our voices. It's long overdue. And we have to speak louder and louder and keep up the drum beat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, in the spirit of speaking um, across movements, I will now invite uh, Selma from Chile to please uh, share some of the work that she's doing um, with the, the union and child care workers in um, supporting public health care workers. Please, over to you, Selma. Gracias. Thank you. Muy buenos días. Buenas tardes. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm very much thankful and also uh, proud to be here with you to share the del trabajo del cuidado y el reconocimiento de quienes trabajamos en este ámbito. quiero enfatizar antes de de responder tu pregunta Rachel, la Internacional de Servicios Públicos también representa a las trabajadoras de del cuidado formal en los servicios públicos motivo por el cual estoy hoy día aquí con ustedes. Desde nuestra posición como sindicato, también creemos que eh, la organización social del cuidado, así como está hoy, es injusta, es desigual, y planteamos reorganizar y reconstruir la actual organización social del cuidado, para lo cual queremos impulsar algunas propuestas que vamos a, a detallar eh, a continuación. Eh, frente a la pregunta, el sindicato al cual pertenezco, la Confederación Nacional de Profesionales de la Salud, eh, ha iniciado hace varios años atrás ya un profundo eh, eh, investigación en materia de cuidado infantil que incluyó un diagnóstico de nuestras unidades educativas 
de la realidad de las trabajadoras formales que hacen la función de cuidado al interior de nuestros hospitales públicos y las condiciones de estos recintos en materia de, de infraestructura. Eh, en mi caso, yo soy educadora de párvulo de profesión, trabajo con niños y niñas en edad preescolar en un hospital pediátrico de Santiago, nuestra región metropolitana, eh, y este funciona las 24 horas del día y los 365 días del año, atendiendo a hijos e hijas de nuestras trabajadoras eh, al interior del hospital y con algunas excepciones de padres que tienen la custodia de sus hijos e hijas o abuelas que tienen eh, también la tuición de sus nietos o nietas. El único requisito es que sean funcionarias de nuestro establecimiento de salud. Eh, el nivel de salacuna, es decir, los menores de dos años, eh, es absolutamente gratuito eh, y el cuidado de jardín infantil, que es eh, entre los niños entre los dos y los cuatro años, eh, tiene un costo de alrededor 15 eh, dólares mensuales, eh, pero es una realidad desigual a lo largo de eh, todo el territorio. Eh, yo ya llevo 25 años ejerciendo esta hermosa profesión y no ha sido fácil enfrentar eh, la realidad del cuidado de hijos e hijas de compañeras de trabajo, las que realizan extensas jornadas laborales que van desde 9 o 12 horas diarias y a veces 24 y 36 de acuerdo a la realidad eh, de déficit de personal eh, y en este caso, en este momento, en tiempos de pandemia, con mayor razón. Eh, y en algunas circunstancias, la mayoría, diría yo, no tienen familiares, eh, redes de apoyo o personas de confianza que le cuiden. Eh, networks that can take care of their children. So in that context, we as formal child care workers become their support become an essential part of the life of this working mothers who work with a waged uh, in a waged job thanks to the work of other women such as myself those mothers working 24 24 hours are also stigmatized the society does not understand the delegation of this type of work, even when uh, our institutions actually provide good conditions for children, even better conditions that at their own homes. Mothers work, uh, work better because they are closer to their children and they are part of the whole educational process and a developmental process that we carry out in our facilities and they are part of the activities that our schools, our kindergartens are doing because these are part of our healthcare facilities as well. With the diagnosis uh, given by our organization in terms of educational units within hospitals in my country, we realized that there were several different realities in the territory from the inequality in terms of infrastructure to the labor conditions of those who provide care in health care institutions. The division of responsibilities, care responsibilities, is extremely unfair and it's especially the burden in, on the homes and it's not being paid to women. Care work is characterized by a low wage and precarious labor conditions, even when the reality of the public workers in Chile is most privileged thanks to the historical demands made by the trade unions in this sector. Despite of this, we have workers uh, working for free without any social protection. In the public health sector, the trade union has been 
pushing for the childcare sector for our workers beyond what our law says, which establishes a limit of uh, two years, two years old. Work uh, care for children that are two years old. This was thanks to what has been worked during the Bachelet administration, but we had to continue insisting to install this demand in all our health care services. This demand and the work that we have been developing with local authorities, of course, uh, with much great effort, have had a positive impact. Right now, 80% of our healthcare institutions have uh, nursery sectors, 60% have uh, kindergartens children for children between two and four years old, and 20% of them have schools for children between four and 12 years old. In hours that are uh, opposite or alternative to the formal educational system. Today, this demand is a public policies, policy only an in facto uh, policy. We want these educational units to be in our facilities. But what is the problem that we're facing today? Chile is one as a country, one of the countries one of the most neoliberal countries in the world, and the heart of its current constitution is a subsidiary. That is, the subsidiary role has made the state to lower or given, given the pensions to the private sector, just as uh, some essential services such, such as water. And in the case of hospitals, this can be built and managed by private companies as well. So this is the greatest problem we face because these units have uh, have had their value threefold, and they only have been given the care to children below two years old. So this is this is a historical demand by our trade union. Given the character, the most important thing has been to delegate to the family the child care services. Along with the de-articulation of public services such as health and education, where there is more amount of workers who are essential for the public network that guarantees healthcare and cares as a whole. So today we have a historic opportunity to move forward in change and to defeat Chilean neoliberalism. Thanks to the last weekend's elections, we've chosen a constitutional convention equal with the purpose of drafting constitutional project that guarantees these basic rights and it will be verified via referendum so the challenges are many social demands are heterogeneous heterogeneous but the central component of the social outburst from the year 2019 in our country has been linked to the demands of feminist movements evidencing the complete absence of government as regard cares, health care and other cares, demand that we agree with and we share as a community. So we believe that the struggle and the fight for decent work cannot be left behind. It has to be linked with our efforts. We have to have basis on the rights that guarantees the basic human rights to care, to health care and other types of cares to be cared for and take care of. So to leave this crisis behind, we have to reconstruct the social aspect of care. 
So we have for this the five R's slogan to recognize the social value of care work, paid and unpaid, to compensate this work with equal salary for a work of equal value, to reduce the amount of work, of unpaid work for women. We want to change. Not only us women are qualified to take care of others. We have to restore the duty and responsibility of the government to provide public services for care and to develop care systems that transforms the lives of women by strengthening the public system with a progressive tax system, both on a national and international level. And to conclude, Chile is going through a historic moment to post this proposal. The reconstruction of care work through the elaboration of the drafting of a new constitution is a major challenge for us. And our goal is that there is a basic acknowledgement of the work of care for workers in the public service. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Thelma. Thank you very much, Thelma. That was a that was a, um, such an important contribution, and we stand in solidarity with you in Chile uh, during this very important political moment. And thank you too for sharing the manifesto um, that is here uh, in the chat that outlines the five R's. I think that can be a guidance not uh, to, to all of us um, and also uh, a way forward to seize these political opportunities that you're now seeing in Chile. So we stand in solidarity. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to, to hand over now to, to Fish and Sheila. Um, who are um, both working with and, and in the case of Sheila is a domestic worker. And I, I'd just like to ask the first question is to Fish about, can you give us some um, arguments as to why domestic workers should be considered childcare workers? Because so often in these debates, um, around childcare, domestic workers are not considered to be childcare workers, even though they provide some of these services. Over to you, Fish. Yes, thank you, Rachel. Uh, good day, good night, everybody from uh, joining uh, from you to you with uh, IDWF, the International Domestic Workers Federation. Joining with me today is Sheila Estrada, a migrant domestic worker in Hong Kong for over 30 years, uh, the chair of Progressive Labor Union of Domestic Workers in Hong Kong. So domestic workers are really the crucial part of the childcare workforce. Rich countries, especially in Asia, uh, the work has been very much won by migrant domestic workers who are only temporary migrants, meaning no matter how many years they are working in the destinations, they don't enjoy rights of residency. They come to take care of the children, elderly, and families in the destinations, leaving their own children, parents, and families behind without social protections for their own children and families. And when they get old, they have to go back to home countries without pension. So today I want to focus on childcare and migrant domestic workers, as this is a growing phenomenon that the richer destinations like Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, Malaysia depend so much on migrant domestic workers to bear the childcare work. And um, the world has over 70 million domestic workers and 11.5 million are migrant domestic workers. And the migrant domestic workers compose higher proportion of domestic workers population, especially in high income countries, as you can see on the screen. And in Hong Kong, 13% households are hiring 
390,000 migrant domestic workers. In Singapore, 20% households, one fifth of households are hiring 250,000 migrant domestic workers. And high income countries here, you can see the governments are spending so little, little on childcare. You can see here in Hong Kong and Singapore, they spend only 0.20% of the GDP on childcare and primary services or educations. Government aided childcare services in Hong Kong for babies less than two years is only one per 114. And households really depend on the grandparents and largely on migrant domestic workers to provide childcare. And in average, a household save more than US dollar 700 when a migrant domestic worker is hired to provide the work. So I've mentioned the destination's dependence on migrant domestic workers on childcare. Now I pass over to Sheila Estrada to share, uh, to share uh, how she and her fellow workers handled the childcare left behind. Over to you, Sheila. Ah. Hi, uh, thank you, Fish. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for inviting us here today. Um, as a migrant domestic worker mother of two, uh, I, can, I can see in the Philippines, there's a Migrant Workers Act that it's an act that uh, institute the policies of overseas employment and establish standard of protection and promotion of the welfare of migrant workers, their families, and overseas Philippine in distress, and for other families. The Department of Labor, the Department of Social Welfare and Development, and the Department of Justice uh, join hands to protect children of overseas Filipinos. But through this, um, this uh, situation of the act, uh, the, we have the Department of Labor through the Overseas Workers Welfare Administration, also signed a mutual understanding with the Department of Social Welfare and Development and the Department of Justice for the provision of full protection to children left behind by OFWs. I mean, OFWs is the Overseas Filipino Workers. Violence against children stated that migration is one of the reasons of physical, sexual, psychological violence to children. Uh, this is real, uh, that is happening really in our country, and this is our own experience. Under the agreement of the Overseas Workers Welfare, it will intensify child protection campaigns on violence against children. The Overseas Filipino Workers raise concerns by conducting regular consultations and monitoring of family of welfare officers, dissemination of the child abuse and exploitations information, and assist in the distribution of materials to the overseas Filipino workers, family circle, and, and OFW help desk. Integrate child abuse and exploitation module prepared by the DSWD in the conduct of trainings and orientations of overseas Filipinos and their families and report suspected cases or incidents of child abuse to to the, to the SWD and DOJ and other law enforcement authorities. Uh, it was been an, an executive order that the SWD to take the lead in its implementing rules and regulations, uh, giving psychosocial interventions, referrals of cases to OWA. Integrate issues and concerns of children of OFWs in the family development sessions and Parenting effective decisions. Mutual of understanding complements with the Republic Act 7610 and Act of providing stronger deference and special protection against child abuse, exploitation and discrimination, and act of violence against women and their children. But with all this that I have said, uh, we have all this uh, kind of protection, but how many 
migrant domestic workers from Philippines know about this protection that we have in law. Uh, because uh, we will really find out that the information dissemination was not really active and there's no monitoring either. So seems the, the, the protection was too good to see and to read, but the implementation is weak, uh, especially to us mothers who, who our children was been left behind in the care of our siblings or the, uh, to the grandparents of our children. Usually we have uh, a negative uh, effect on the migration work. It's been a long time called for, for the union and other partners in the Philippines and global partners are calling for the Philippines to, to make it a choice of the migration work. It's not an easy city for family because we've been suffering a lot, uh, like on the gap on the relationship with our children. Um, that's why we're calling for a decent work for, for with a decent uh, with a decent uh, living wage so that we can we can be with our children as most of our children grow grow old without their the real mothers there so this is one one problem we are almost every day that we are facing as migrant mothers um we've been uh trying to to talk to the government to lessen migration we can we all know that we cannot stop migration work but uh to create jobs in our country to, to prevent our children who suffered enough uh, from separation of parents uh, will be uh, having the chance to work in the Philippines and not go for migration. But of course, uh, we did not say migration will not be there. Uh, we always say that migration will still be there anywhere. And the only thing is, uh, just to listen the effect of migration to families. Uh, I can share some of, of my friends and even my own experience when I left behind my, my 10 months old second born. Uh, when I go back to Philippines after a year, she never know me anymore as her mom. So, and then it grows a lot and we, we do a lot of counseling either uh, to parents in here who saw, host their children suffered a lot of stress and sometimes they, they have this uh, mental uh, thinking of the mom never loves them because it was been like for a long time we are we are away from them. So there's a lot of gaps on the relationship, the love and how we connect with our children but uh, still, uh, Philippines is one, we all know is one of the, I think in Asia, it's the number one who's sending uh, work, Filipino workers abroad. And I hope uh, like this kind of, of forums, uh, we, can, we can also share and, and ask the government and maybe some of the, the panelists or the, or the people here now uh, in this forum can, can also think about uh, lessening migration because of the negative effect from our own children. Um, we do know that there's a, this kind of protection. Uh, usually, if you are not in the trade union, of course, we, we, you don't know this kind of information. So we are now educating more mothers, uh, more parents to, to look into this protection, uh, to, to use them, uh, to take care of their own children. It's not only um, been been in the in the care of of siblings or the mother or the grandparents, uh, but there will be a protection coming from the government to those children who has been left behind. So the union will continue and our partners to 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 call for this kind of protection for our children who has been left behind uh, to have more better protection while we are away. Um, I have one minute. I already have one minute, so maybe uh, I can answer some of your questions if you, if you have some some for me. Uh, and thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, thank you, Sheila, and and thank you for for sharing from your own personal experience um, what has been a, a difficult experience. But 
I think highlighting also the cost to domestic workers um, of providing care services for others uh, while their children may be lacking those care services back home. And I think that's a really important for us to keep in mind as we think of uh, the reorganization, the, the rebuilding of the social organization of care as Selma has spoken about and what that means for all workers within uh, providing care services. Um, and, and, and so thank you very much for that contribution. I'm, I'm going to um, hand over now to Silke as our discussant to, sh to just share some reflections. Um, I see that there is there are a few questions in the in the Q and A, but I'll hand it over to Silke, and we'll hopefully we'll get to those Q and A questions. Thanks. Thanks, Rachel, and thanks to all the previous speakers. It's a real pleasure to be here and a real honor to have heard from all of you. I mean, these are these have been you know such rich and diverse perspectives. I think a long overdue kind of conversation in this forum between people from different kind of walks of of the care life so to say. So we've, you know, brought in really important technical perspectives, but I think also underlines the profoundly political nature of care work and the kind of mobilization required to make this work visible and to put it on the agenda. And that starts from unpaid care work, which is invisible and underrecognized and inadequately supported to the replication of this undervaluation of what is largely women's work in the paid care sector, right? Among all the workers, um, types of workers that we've heard about in, in previous conversations. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about the role that public investments and in childcare provision can play in economic recovery. Um, and so I wanted to come back to some of the things also that have come out of, of the previous presentations which has really shown that across countries, you know, the pandemic has really revealed the fragility of, of the childcare arrangements as they existed previously. Um, they've relied on families to a large extent, as, as Salma said, they've relied on markets for those who can afford it. And really, you know, the role of the state in many countries, not only Chile, um, has been quite subsidiary to this, um, to this whole question as also Fish's presentation and the data on, on childcare spending has shown. So while the pandemic may have pushed the early childhood education and care sector over the edge, as in the case of South Africa, but also in many developed economies that rely heavily on market-based provision like uh, the US and the UK, these arrangements were already patchy and plagued by pervasive inequalities before the pandemic. And this is precisely what makes them so vulnerable to a shock of this nature. And I think that was very clear in, in, in Mr. Cavana's presentation that for me showed that because of the high degree of informality in the childcare sector in South Africa, it was really, really challenging, you know, despite kind of good attempts and, and best intentions to get support to, to the sector um, in times of great need. What we've been seeing um, here at UN Women and documented here in UN, at UN Women that you know when such a shock as COVID hits, it's disproportionately women because of these fragile arrangements that act as the shock absorbers. Overrepresented as they are in precarious and informal employment, they have seen steeper declines in employment and earnings. And as default family caregivers, they have long picked up the slack where public services are unavailable or unaffordable. But COVID has taken this to a whole new level um, with overwhelmed health services, schools and childcare centers shut down. Families have really witnessed an unprecedented kind of rise in, in care responsibilities. Partly as a result, what we're seeing is women dropping out of the labor force at faster rates than men and in, in worryingly high numbers. In some cases, including Chile and, and many other countries, this has erased decades of gains in female labor force participation. And across countries, it is particularly women with young children who have experienced some of the sharpest um, drops in employment. So just to say that the pandemic has once more revealed that women's employment is shaped by care responsibilities in, in ways that men's is not. Um, and we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that things will easily bounce back to normal once the pandemic subsides. And even if they did, for most women, for most families, for most children, that old normal never really worked as, as we've heard from many of the previous speakers. So um, 
governments should really seize the recovery of the PSI campaign also underlines to build a better and a more caring economy and public investments in quality childcare services are a critical piece of this, of this puzzle. Such investments are needed to help the shattered childcare sector providers bounce back to strengthen both the reach and the quality of childcare services and to enable women with childcare responsibilities to re-enter the labor market and seek better employment um, opportunities. What we've shown is that along the way, such investments could not only transform um, existing childcare jobs into decent jobs, but also generate millions of new ones at a time when governments are struggling to reignite a job-rich recovery. For OECD countries, there's compelling evidence, for example, that investments in child and elder care um, services create significantly more jobs than commensurate in MET investments in construction, for example, which is you know, a male-dominated sector often prioritized for public works and so on. It is perhaps therefore not surprising that the current US administration, for, for example, is proposing to define investments in care services as infrastructure spending recognizing that not unlike roads and bridges and ports, um, those investments enable all kinds of other economic activities. So yes, there, is, um, there are fiscal implications to these public investments, but we've also shown that a large chunk of these investments can be recouped through new tax revenue and social security contributions that result from new jobs being created in those sectors, and that doesn't even account for many of the long-term gains that we've also heard from previous speakers in terms of children's capabilities, women's employment opportunities, and, and broader kind of community well-being that we know um, child care, quality child care services can generate. So there's a clear rationale for why we need to prioritize public investments in child care services for economic recovery, but it also matters, right, how these resources are spent, which modalities they support, and which constituencies they aim to reach and empower as a matter of priority. And there are no um, one size fits all approaches, and countries also don't start on a tabula rasa. You know, a lot of kind of modalities are already in place, but a challenge for all these modalities, whether it's public provision, whether it's community based provision, um, whether it's domestic um, work is to square the needs of children, working parents, and the workers in the sector. And I think Sama's presentation in particular reminded me, you know, the need to square um, the needs of children and working parents who often, you know, not only in the health sector, but also in the informal economy, have very um, special working hours that are often not attended to by, by kind of ECD um, interventions is really important. So obviously a great feat for the healthcare sector to have 24 hour, 365 days um, childcare available for, for the workers in these hospitals. If I have um, another minute or so, I would just like to um, refer to two other, um, I think important um, constituencies that I think any rethinking of, thank you, one more minute, okay, of, of childcare arrangements um, needs to take into account. So in many countries, and we've heard about South Africa, community-based providers already play an important role in providing childcare services to poor and marginalized communities. And these providers do have important strengths, right? They're often close to the communities they serve, they know their realities, and they can adapt services to their specific needs including in terms of opening hours and so on, which is particularly important for women in informal employment. But they're also structurally under-resourced and ignored. They may struggle, as we've heard, to conform to registration requirements or quality standards that for good reasons are put in place um, for public and private providers. So without more public funding, um, they, are, they are unable to kind of be part of that childcare infrastructure that is so important, and they're often unable to ensure affordability for the families and decent working conditions for their staff, as we've also heard in the video. And then the final group I wanted to um, pick up on is, um, and that is usually under-recognized in childcare provision or domestic workers. And so it's critical that these workers have a voice in policy decisions about childcare and that their specific needs, both as childcare providers, but also often as mothers who have their own um, childcare requirements are taken into account. And um, I don't want to take more time away from, from the discussions. So I'll stop here. And, and thank you very much, really, for, for having me and, and making me part of this conversation.
Thank you, Silke, and thank you for wrapping up what was a very rich discussion. Uh, we are coming to the end of our webinar, but I want to take one question that was um, put forward by Rachel Machewski um, to Isabella. Um, so, Isabella, you can see the question in the Q&A, um, but the question from Rachel is, can you tell us more about how you identified and reached out to informal providers in order to register them? What were the biggest challenges you faced in registering informal providers? And were there any criteria that child care providers were required to meet in order to be registered? Um, so just a bit more details on that. We, we, if you can just, I'm sorry to ask, but only one or one minute just so that we can, we can wrap up on time. Thank you very much. Isabella, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. I just want to clarify to your question, is it registration in terms of regulation or are you talking about the access to ECB stimulus package? I think the so that they can gain access to government support. So to the to the, oh, subsidy. the, the general registration. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, I think I should uh, state upfront that, to be honest, uh, the registration process is quite tedious uh, because, uh, you know, the, the ECD sector have got to register more than once, which is twice. They register in terms uh, as a program, but they also have to register, you know, in terms of partial care facilities. Uh, and mostly it has got uh, other government departments implication, your Department of Health is there, your municipalities, uh, you know, the issues, the complications with regard to issues of bylaws. You'll find that uh, from our side, from the Department of Social Development side, the ECD has, you know, uh, been able to qualify to register, you know, or have met all the requirements in terms of the, what we require as Department of Social Development. But when coming to issues of zoning and so much, you know, you find that uh, it is very difficult for them, you know, to penetrate that, especially that uh, they are now residing in informal settlement. It becomes quite uh, tedious. And it is against this background that uh, we currently in a process of reviewing our legislation, as I said earlier, the children's, the principal registration, I mean, the principal legislation, which is your Children's Act or 38 of 2005 to ensure that we try and look, uh, and, and look into these barriers that cause, you know, um, but are very tedious and, uh, you know, are hampering the ECD services to register. So we currently uh, in a process of, you know, debating, we call it the second uh, amendment bill for, for, for children's amendment, uh, the second amendment bill or for Children's Act, uh, which we are currently looking at, and we're looking at trying to, uh, to uh, uh, remove all those barriers. But in the meantime, uh, as I said earlier, we've got the conditional registration uh, framework that we have developed in partnership with uh, our partners, such as, such as Nelson Mandela, Impande, uh, you know, quite a number of stakeholders that have been involved, so that at the moment it serves as a and interim measures to ensure that we really assist our ECDs to register, at least if, if they can have the bare minimum as norms and standards, they can meet the bare minimum in norms and standards for them to be able to register. Thanks. Thank you, um, Ms. Ikawana. That was a very that was a, a very helpful response. Um, we. Uh, have come to the to the end of our, our webinar and I apologize that we were not able to get to all of the questions. Um, I see that Fish is responding to your question, Rachel, around what kind of a framing uh, um, when you consider issues of migrant domestic workers, what does that framing look like? So I see that that question is being answered in the chat. Um, I just want to thank once again all of the all of the panelists for such a rich and diverse conversation. I think it really shows the value of coming together across um, across different sectors and across different movements. And from the presentations from Selma and Fish and Sheila, we really get the the complexity of of 
care of care providers, the, the challenges that they face day to day, both in providing care, the discrimination and stigmatization they face, as well as um, the, the essential work that they do and their own child care needs. So I really want to thank them for, for being in this space and to Isabella and to Elizabeth for um, the, the, the experience that you've brought, the technicality, the, the, the sort of granularity that you've brought to the discussion, Isabella, around how does registration happen? How do we then formalize what is currently informal is so critical. Um, and to Elizabeth, I think we would all like to hear more about the child care campaign and look forward to, to collaborating with ECDAN on that and developing that further. So thank you to everyone who has participated. Thank A big thank you to the interpreters who have followed us throughout and have made it possible for us to speak across countries and time zones. Um, before we end, I just want to say that in the chat, there is uh, some additional materials that have been shared. Um, by um, a colleague in Argentina. Uh, so please, uh, if that's of interest to others, please do to access that. And finally, special thanks to socialprotection.org for hosting us today. Um, have a good evening, a good afternoon, and a very good morning to those of you who are still getting ready. <laughs> thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Rachel. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.